today we are here to discuss hospital births and preparing for hospital births and what to expect for hospital births. Um, and we have a long list of questions that we've come up with that we hear frequently from our patients, but also that you've submitted to us. So we're really excited to dig in. Um, we have a special offer for everybody through Ladybird PT for discounted birth preparation visits. So if you look into the chat box, I submitted or I just entered our website where you can contact us to book that birth prep visit. And then I also gave you a code. So you're going to have a discount for, for that appointment if you do decide to do that. So feel free to check that out at any point throughout this process. Just as a disclaimer, we are not claiming that a hospital birth is the best or only option. We're just here to discuss that specific option because it is the right one for a lot of people. So if you hear us talking about hospital births and you're not hearing about other, other options, birthing center births, home births, that's not because those aren't there for you. It's just because that's not the purpose of today's, today's conversation. I'm actually going to be hosting a birthing center birth conversation later this week. So if you want to know more about those options, please feel free to reach out and let me know. My last disclaimer is that we're going to be recording today's webinar. We can't see your faces, we can't see your names, but if you submit a question into the chat box, we might say your name when we read it out loud. So if you're not comfortable with your name being mentioned on the recording, please feel free to exit and then we can always send you the recording. And if you have to leave early, we'll also have a recording of, of this if you can't stay until the end. So please feel free to reach back out for that. Um, and if you have questions throughout this whole process, drop them in the chat box. We probably won't be answering clinical questions until the end, but if you want clarification on anything, I'll kind of be scanning the chat. And I just saw Mercedes say, I don't see the code. The code is just birth prep 2020. So you see it in capitals code birth prep 2020. Does anybody else see that? If nobody else tells me they can't, you can't see it. Oh no. Oh, I sent it to panelists. Okay, I'm sorry about that, y'all. Thank you for setting me straight. You should see it now. If anybody can confirm that they can see it now, that would be fantastic. Cool, perfect. Um, Dr. Skarsga, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Dr. Bailey Skarsga. I'm an OBGYN physician here in Austin. Um, I am from Houston originally and did my um, undergrad at Tulane University in New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina hit while I was finishing school, so I ended up completing my degree in engineering in um, upstate New York at a random engineering school called Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Nobody ever knows what it is in Texas. but um, And then I uh, did a master's program at the um, medical school in Fort Worth. I did med school myself at Texas Tech out in El Paso, which is where I met my husband. Um, and then I did my residency training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Um, I have two kids. Um, one is two and a half and he's asleep right now and the other one is five weeks and you're probably going to see my husband like frantically running back and forth because he's on dad duty right now while I'm doing this and we have like one of those like open houses so um, I don't really have like a private room to go to. Um, so I apologize if you guys hear a screaming newborn in the background. Um, and uh, I went into OB because I love taking care of women. I love um, labor and delivery and, and delivering babies. I actually, during medical school, um, planned my OB rotation to be the first one because I was pretty convinced I did not want to do it. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to get it out of the way and I attended my first birth and cried and thought it was just like the coolest thing ever. And I love that there was like so much that you could do in terms of caring for women throughout their whole life um, from teenage years to reproductive years, menopause, um, and that there was never that each day was different and you're never bored. So um, that's why I love, I love doing it. I go back to work next week, which I'm, you know, a little bit of mixed feelings about. I'm excited to get back to work. I love, I love what I do and I love working, but I am sad to leave my, what will be a six week old. Um, so all of my patients, I'll be right there with you talking about postpartum stuff. <laughs> Um, and I thank you so much for introducing yourself. And I think that that's, I mean, it's kind of amazing. You have this really unique insight into what your patients are going through right now. And I'm sure that you felt a lot of the things that a lot of our viewers and our attendees are feeling. So 
Um, I don't know how much you want to share your personal experience, but it certainly gives you an, an interesting perspective. And for, for our attendees to know that that's kind of the perspective that you're coming at this from, I think is really helpful. Just yeah. a quick introduction. My name is Rebecca Madansky. I'm a pelvic floor physical therapist. I own Ladybird PT, which is a clinic that specializes in pregnancy and postpartum rehab, recovery, childbirth preparation. Um, my other physical therapist, Anissa, is in this call as well. And we're, we're really excited to have you all here. Um, and we're just really excited to dig into some questions with you, Dr. Escarziga, and ask the questions that we get fielded all the time and that we might not be the most equipped to answer, but also to ask the questions that everybody else has submitted. So let's start with kind of like an easy one. Just question, what kind of questions do you suggest people ask their OBs when choosing a care provider? Because I think that that is, I mean, choosing the right care provider, I think is something that people are starting to come into awareness about now. Mm -hmm. And they're start, we're starting to see more and more lists of how to determine whether your provider is supportive of your VBAC or your cesarean birth or your unmedicated birth. But what kind of questions do you suggest that, that patients ask their providers when they're in that kind of, that questioning phase? Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple of things. So, um, and just to throw another disclaimer is just like, although I am a doctor, I'm not your doctor for anybody that's listening. Yeah. And even if one of my patients happens to be listening right now, I'm not in the capacity of being your doctor tonight. So um, just keep that in mind. They're just general answers. Um, I think if you ask several OBs kind of like, what is the best way to find the provider that's best for you, you probably get several different types of answers. But a general theme, I would say, um, talk to friends, right? And friends who are potentially going through the same things in their lives right now that you are. So if they're planning a, a family or have had kids, um, you know, talk to them about OBs that they have, that they have felt very comfortable with and felt like well taken care of. Um, and then, you know, I think one thing that we all do whenever we're looking for, you know, for example, another hairstylist or an attorney to help you write your will or whatever, you know, you always go to friends and then you go to online sources to see like reviews. And I caution everybody about reviews with providers because I will say like nine times out of 10, um, the, the bad online reviews probably are related to things that are out of the provider's control, such as billing and scheduling. Um, and, you know, so just keep that in mind that providers are not the ones handling your bills or anything like that. And then um, typically when a provider is, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but when a provider is um, running super behind and, and you're waiting forever, just think about what might have been going on with that patient before you. Like maybe it was a miscarriage that was unanticipated or maybe there was a complication with their post-op course or something and they wanted to give that patient all the time that they needed. And um, all of us are trying to stay on time. <laughs> so um, those are the kind of two things when you're looking for somebody and then when you're actually like in the room talking to people, I think it's really important that you communicate um, and kind of advocate for yourself about what your needs are and um, kind of where you're coming from. So if, for example, you're interested in a VBAC, you know, make that very clear from the beginning and make sure that they're, not only your provider is on board with it, but their practice is on board with it because the practice may be the one taking care of you when it comes time for you actually to deliver your baby rather than that particular provider because they're not available that day. Um, or for example, if you're somebody who has pelvic pain or had a really hard time with pelvic exams in the past, like I can't read your mind and, you know, maybe you could talk and say, is a pelvic exam necessary in today's visit? And if it's not, we don't have to do one. Or if it is, you know, we you just say like, what can we be doing? And so, so that it's a little bit more comfortable for me because I've had a hard time with pelvic exams in the past. And I think that speaks volumes because then I know what I can be doing differently to help you feel more comfortable um, along the way. So kind of communicating your needs from the beginning and that, and, and that really helps. I think that that's really useful insight. And I think that's something that so many of us struggle with, even as a healthcare provider myself, advocating for ourselves in medical settings, because it's so difficult to to know that you're not the expert in the room and then also keep your agency. So I think that that's a really great point to raise. And then as far as what you said earlier about asking your friends, I mean, when people reach out to me and ask me for OB recommendations, I like my biggest point of like what, what leads me to say your practice really the vast majority of the time is that my patients love their experiences mm -hmm. with your practice. And I think that that's what speaks volumes. The reviews mm -hmm. will say what the reviews say, but if you can talk to other people going through the same 
the same thing. And if you can hear their perspective on their experience, I mean, it's just so wildly helpful. And so I agree. And I think it creates a really special bond too. Um, personally, anecdotally, I'll say, you know, if I have a patient and then their friend starts coming to see me and it's like this really cool bond that all of us have, um, because then it's like, oh, you know, this person and I don't know. I, I just, I think that that says a lot um, from my perspective. And then also for the patient perspective, I think like if it's, if your friend who is going through something similar as you has had a great experience, like that is huge. Absolutely. And the trust that that builds also, mm -hmm. I think is really incredible. Um, okay. Moving on. Cause I don't want to spend way too much time on one question. This one is about epidurals. What is the impact of an epidural on birth outcomes? I think that there are a lot of people these days who really want an unmedicated birth either because of fear of an epidural or the unknown with the epidural. And what I see in my practice is a lot of people who, who aren't sure or who are really scared of intervention because again, we're starting to learn more about intervention. So what, what is the impact of an epidural? Yeah. So they, you know, for a long time, I think a lot of us have all thought that maybe that epidurals may slow down labor. Um, and there have been several studies that have looked at this um, to see and comparing women with different types of epidurals versus um, an unmedicated labor and like over studying thousands and thousands of women, we have not been able to show um, any sort of association between a longer labor or um, in, in term, labor in terms of getting from when you started contractions to 10 centimeters. Um, that, that, that time is going to be the same no matter if you have an epidural or not. Um, and the, the way in which you're delivered, be it vaginal delivery versus C-section, has no, the epidural has no effect on that. And I know that that's a lot of people anecdotally will tell you differently and they're really convinced that their epidural is the reason for why things went the way they went. Um, but from a, a research-based perspective, we haven't been able to see that sort of association. So what I always tell everybody is, um, if you want an epidural, great. If you don't, no problem. Um, we're going to support you either way. If you end up getting one and didn't think that you were going to, or that wasn't part of your original plan, don't feel defeated and don't feel like whatever happens was related to the epidural. Um, an epidural has been shown to lengthen what's called the second stage of labor, which is the stage where we are pushing. So from getting, let's say you have water breaks at home, you come into the hospital, you're four centimeters dilated, and you know, the time that it takes for you to get from four to 10, that's gonna be the same with or without an epidural, but from 10 to delivering of the baby, meaning that pushing phase, that's gonna be longer with an epidural because it's harder to feel effectively how to push. Um, so we give you longer, if you have an epidural, we give you a longer time knowing that. Um, there was one study that did show that there was maybe an increased rate of operative vaginal delivery, meaning forceps or a vacuum um, when you had an epidural. I don't know um, how much of that is maybe possibly biased by the fact that an ep analgesia, meaning an epidural is required to do an operative delivery. And so of course that's gonna be a higher rate of that's operative deliveries amongst that patient population. But um, so if from a, what, what I would tell everybody is that an epidural does not have an effect on your ability to have a vaginal birth. If it doesn't end up being a vaginal birth, it's likely not due to your epidural. That's, that's really interesting. So I have two follow-up questions for you and I'll see if I can remember them both because I thought of them throughout that process. Yeah. My one question for you is that I know that there's research that shows that being upright through early stage of labor will reduce the length of the second stage of labor. And I don't know if you're familiar with that research, but that's what I've, I've kind of like seen here and there. And my question to you would be, if you have the epidural, you're likely not going to be upright. So, and I think somebody asked me this, but is there an ideal time to have the epidural that allows you to stay mobile as long as possible to shorten that second stage of labor? Or is that just an unfounded, is that just unfounded belief? Yeah, I mean, there, it's, it's a little bit of a complicated answer. So there was a trial that came out of the UK called the BUMPS trial um, that looked at women who had an epidural versus not um, and who birthed in an upright position. And they actually found um, that those with an epidural, I, and I don't want to be, apologies if I'm quoting this incorrectly, um, but it, those with an epidural um, deliver, were more likely to deliver, um, and that, that low dose epidural had a higher chance of vaginal birth in an upright position with like a squat bar. Mm -hmm. um, but um, now I'm like kind of losing my train of thought. 
So to answer the question about whether or not there's like an ideal time, that's variable and it's hard for everybody. Um, I know that's a common question that we get. So the num like the, the number of centimeters you are, like that doesn't matter. A, an anesthesiologist can place an epidural at one centimeter or at 10 centimeters. The only like requirement is that you're sitting still so that they can place it safely. Um, you can't be like, you know, writhing around in bed and screaming. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I always tell my patients is if you think you're going to want one, don't wait until you're screaming to ask for it. Um, but in terms of effectively getting a vaginal birth out of it, um, you know, that also can still be at any time. I think that um, the mobility part of it is very valid. And I don't, you know, I think some people will, like their water will break at home and they're not contracting yet. And they come in, they're like, well, I'm gonna want an epidural. Should I go ahead and get one now? And I always say, no, that you should wait until you're actually really feeling something. So it's kind of this fine line between we want right. you feeling something, but we don't want you screaming. Um, so because, not at the very beginning or right. like when it's, like you'll know when it's before too late. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. It's very clear having just told myself, like there was a transition point where it was like, okay, now I got to get one. Right. Um, but the, we want you to be able to get up and move around because yeah, m movement during early labor has been shown to help improve outcomes. Um, we don't want you laying around in the bed, but also know that if you get an epidural, your nurses are not just going to let you lay there. Like they're going to be in every 20 to 30 minutes, flipping you from side to side, trying sitting up positions, like they're gonna try to get you moving around, even though it is in the bed. That's really interesting because I, you know, a fear that I hear from a lot of my patients is like, I get the epidural and I'm just laying on my back then for the rest of this. And so right. I think that hearing that labor and delivery nurses are getting you moving oh, yeah. um, is really fantastic. And also a perfect segue into our next question, which is what kind of laboring positions are available to you if you have an epidural? Because I will talk to people about a squat bar and make sure that you talk to your provider. That that's something that you want, make sure it's something that you can have and supported sideline. But what kind of positions are typically supported in a hospital setting after an epidural? Yeah, so the, the, you will be in bed, um, and that is the one thing, um, once you have the epidural, that you have to keep in mind, but um, they'll switch you from left to right, they'll use a peanut ball, um, they'll sit you up in what's called high fowlers, which is where you're like, as if you're in a chair position, but in the bed, um, and, you know, sometimes we'll do hands and knees because of fetal indications, meaning the baby's heart rate has dropped and we're trying to get the baby off of your big major blood vessels to help increase blood flow. And we have to help you get into the, that hands and knees position because the epidural kind of makes you dead below the, the waist and it's like a dead weight. Um, but that's also a possibility too. Um, so, you know, there, there are multiple options and you don't have to push flat on your back either. Um, and, you know, I, I, I know I hear that a lot from people like that I have to push on my back and that's definitely not true. You can push in whatever position you want, knowing though that the epidural is going to give you a little bit of a dead weight feeling in the bottom half. Um, the other caveat that I mentioned to that is that if there is a rare emergency called a shoulder dystocia, which is where the baby's head comes out, but the body does not, um, and there's certain maneuvers that we have to do to help facilitate getting the rest of the baby out. The most ideal position for you to be in at that point is called lithotomy, which is where you're on your back with your legs up in the stirrups. And I think that might be where some of that comes from, where it's just like, well, the provider is more comfortable with you on your back. But like, I, I will tell you at least uh, myself, my, my partners, and most newer OBs who are trained in the past you know, 10, 15 years, um, do not feel that way. You know, we're happy to have you push in whatever position we want, you want, as long as we're able to quickly get you to your back if an emergency arises. That's really fantastic to hear and I'm sure is really comforting to a lot of our attendees as well because I think that that is kind of a myth and it's in mm -hmm. talking to my patients who specifically birth with your practice, that's not something that they've experienced. And, mm -hmm. you know, in my, I don't know every OB nor have I, I don't have a relationship with every practice, but that's really helpful to, to yeah. know. Maybe that is kind of where that myth comes from. Yeah. Um, one more question. This is just for my own clarification. After an epidural, is it can they support themselves with their upper body into a squat position with a squat bar after an epidural? Yeah, I, I, right before I went out for maternity leave, one of my patients delivered with an epidural, delivered with the squat bar, um, and pushed with the squat bar the whole time. 
Um, and so you have all of your upper body strength, you know, none of, the, none of that's affected by the epidural and they'll position the bed in a way where you've still got back support. Like, okay. so, so your back is here, the back of the bed is here. So this is like bed and you, and then there's a squat bar here that you're leaning onto with your hands. So you're not doing a pull up, you're leaning onto it. You're leaning onto it, yeah. Okay, that yeah. makes sense, that makes yeah. sense. Um, okay, that's helpful to know. Mm -hmm. um, one more epidural question. I'm sorry for those of you who are sick of this, but, and we've talked about this before, Dr. Escarza, back, back when we met, I mean, like months ago, but a walking epidural. And I remember what you said to me at that time, but for, um, for our other listeners, can you talk about a walking epidural for us? Yeah, so it's it's a funny. It's not something that is standard um, in the United States. I do think it's something that was um, offered in Europe um, or may still be offered in Europe, but um, it's not something that is standardly offered. The idea behind it is that it's an epidural placed just like the your standard epidural, but with a lower dose of both um, opiate and then long-acting uh, medications. And so the thought is that you would get some relief of contraction pain but not have um, so much medication that you would not be able to get up and move around. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that's offered at our hospital um, that I'm aware of. And I think if it is offered at other hospitals, you would just have to talk to the anesthesiologist about it, but it's not a standard thing in the United States. Um, so I, yeah, and it's, I, and I, don't, I don't know the reason behind that. I, it would be interesting to talk to an anesthesiologist about kind of what's the reasoning for not not doing that routinely. Yeah, I can. My my dad is an anesthesiologist, so I can yeah. reach out to him and see what yeah, he said. Let me know. What is that? Um, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people get confused too because online people talk about it as being what's called a combined spinal epidural or CSE, and they're used synonymously, but they're two very different things. A combined spinal epidural can be used for a, a routine scheduled C section as well as a laboring patient, but it is not the same thing as a, a walking epidural. It's just a different dose of the medication placed in the, in the, the same space. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll have to look into that because it, that is something that I've, I've heard about and read about, but I've never talked to anybody who's, who's had one. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, we touched on this a little bit, and this is something that I talk to, to patients a lot about, but benefits and risks of pushing in different positions. What are your thoughts on laboring on all fours versus in sideline versus in the upright position? Yeah, I think whatever is most comfortable for the patient is honestly the best because we want you to feel like it's the experience that you wanted to have. And we're also not the ones like feeling the contractions and the pain that you're feeling. And you can tell us best what feels best. Um, so as long as everything is safe with you and baby, like let's do whatever position you wanna do. Um, the there have not been any positions that have shown an increased rate of like a third or a fourth degree tear which is where you get tears that involve the sphincter mm -hmm. um, of the anus and or actually the rectum itself um none of that has been shown so whatever position you want to be in i think is the one we should be doing I remember reading, there are two articles that I feel like are relevant to this. I remember reading one by the Royal College of Midwives that found that directed pushing had a higher association with grade three and four tears versus patient-led pushing. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you're, and, and again, like, I don't know if that is tainted by the fact that if you have an epidural, maybe you need more directed pushing mm -hmm. and you can't feel as much what's happening. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I I typically do directed pushing with my patients, um, but uh, you know I, it's fine not to. I think that anytime there's a study, there's probably like an equal and opposing study available. I'd have to look at that one in particular to see, but I anecdotally have not found a difference um, in, in the rate of, of tearing. I think what really helps to reduce your rate of tearing is perineal massage, which is something that we do during pushing for you and something that you could start at home um, prior to delivery as well. And then warm, um, warm compresses, which is something we also do. And that really helps um, yeah. with blood flow and, and thinning out that tissue on its own naturally. And so I think if you're doing those things in whatever position you want, I think you're gonna have a better chance at a, a lower tear than, than not. 
How, how many weeks do you typically recommend people begin antenatal perineal massage? Because I usually see 34 to 36 weeks, and yeah, I don't know I why there's that range. I think it's just Brittany, whoever you talk to. There's no great data on a particular week, so I just tell everybody 35 or 36. Okay. I usually see everybody at 36 weeks to do their okay. group strep test, and so that's when I mention it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so moving on from the epidural topic on to, into induction. So what are, what options do people have at 40, 41, 42 weeks if they go past their due date? Do they have to be induced at a certain point throughout? I mean, I'm, I'm you know, at a certain point, are there other options? What, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So you never have to do anything, you know, um, what we'll recommend is one thing versus what we do, you know, that's shared decision-making. So, um, you know, the due date is at 40 weeks, anything beyond 40 weeks is considered um, post term. Um, but really it's not considered like medically indicated until you are late term, which is technically 42 weeks. We as a practice and the hospital have agreed that 41 weeks is still considered a medical indication since you are one week past your due date. But I think that timing between 41 and 42 weeks is a discussion that you have with your provider on what their comfort level is and what your comfort level is. But I think a hard and fast stop for most of us would be 42 weeks um, because the rate of stillbirth goes up so high after that. Um, what we would be doing if you wanted to go as long as you possibly could after 41 weeks, we would do um, increased testing in the office just to make sure the baby's looking okay. Um, and probably some more frequent visits to check on you and your blood pressure. Um, in terms of other things that you can do that will maybe help with labor that don't um, necessarily involve an induction, we can do what's called membrane stripping. Um, which is where it's as similar to getting a cervical check in the office where we check to see how dilated you are. Um, but it's a circular motion that we do to help separate the membranes from the opening of the cervix. And this is supposed to release prostaglandins, which helps induce labor. I will tell you, I've done it on patients and they've gone like they're holding their baby by the next morning. Um, I've also done it and like two weeks later, they're still pregnant. So um, it's not a hard and fast, perfect um, thing, but that's one option that you can try. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you can read online about like spicy food and pineapple and go for a walk and all this stuff. Um, go for it. You're welcome to try all of it. None of it's been like statistically shown to do anything. The only um, thing that we found that has been shown to um, induce labor is intercourse and it's not the act of intercourse. It's actually semen. So semen, exposure of semen to the, the membranes. Also interesting. Prostaglandin release, yeah, that may help reduce. Or I mean, that's interesting. I knew that intercourse was, was recommended often, but I didn't know that it was because of semen. That's really Yeah, so like they, he actually has to ejaculate. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's, you know, they should tell people that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <Or> you do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys see my husband and my baby in the background. <laughs> so oh, I like saw a flash. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, there was another part of your question about induction. Uh, maybe not. Induction right. alternatives, maybe? Um, I, I would just mention that the membrane stripping and the um, and intercourse and, and just if we're really not going to induce, um, despite it being medically indicated, that you are on board with your provider at least doing more frequent testing of you and the baby so that we can make sure everything looks okay. And what did you call the technique that, that is the membrane stripping? Um, so it's, it's just, that's what it's called. So it's um, two fingers digitally in the vagina to check the cervix and then um, those, those two fingers get placed through the cervix and just it's like a circular motion that uh, separates the membranes from the cervix. Um, that is really helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one, one last question, and then we'll get to some registered questions or some, some of the questions that we got from our attendees when they registered. So what can you expect will be different during a hospital birth in the midst of COVID-19? And who should you talk to about concerns? Um, and I know that, again, you're uniquely positioned to answer this. So. Yeah. Um, so it's very hospital dependent. So talk to your provider about what's going on at your particular hospital at Seton. Um, what they're doing now, if it's a scheduled delivery, meaning it's a scheduled C-section or a scheduled induction, you get tested for COVID a week out um, and they ask you to isolate at home um, just with your immediate family until your induction date. Even if your result comes back two days later and it's negative, they still ask that you stay at home so that that negative test truly stays negative until your, your delivery date. 
Um, if it's positive, nothing is going to change about your delivery, but it just helps give the hospital enough time to like get the appropriate personal protective equipment and have the room ready that has like the appropriate airflow exchange and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you are not a scheduled delivery, when you show up in labor, everybody is getting tested. Um, it's part of like routine, like when you come in and you get admitted, you get lab work done, they're also adding in a COVID test now too. Okay. Um, the admission into the hospital is a little bit different. So previously, like all of the entrances were open. Right now there's only one into the off, uh, hospital and one exit out. Um, so the entrance is either, um, and this again is hospital dependent, but at Seton it's through the ER or through the south entrance, depending on the time of day that you show up, and the exit's through the north entrance. Um, you and your support person will be screened and get a temperature check. Um, they're only allowing one support person at this time, so that includes partners, spouses, family members, doulas, it's just one person. Um, and then uh, you both will be required to wear a mask throughout the rest of your stay, and that includes your labor too. So when I delivered, um, I wore a mask the whole time and wore a mask with pushing, and it's tough, yeah. um, but we're trying to keep everybody, including the staff and you, safe. Of course. And there are people who um, don't have symptoms until like two days after they come in contact with you and then all of a sudden they test positive and then three days later you start having symptoms you know so we just can't know who you know that it's totally safe so that's why we're having everybody wear masks yeah yeah no that I mean it makes sense it's uncomfortable but I it also is it's a difficult position for everybody to be in so that that sounds sensible um, yeah. One question that I had to, that was a follow up to that that somebody submitted was who can they talk to and what is the policy because we've heard these stories of babies being separated from parents mm -hmm. if the mother if the birthing person tested positive yeah um, so what have you seen and seen in and what what does that look like. So um, the pediatrician will come by and talk to um, the mom and the, the family at birth and explain that their recommendation is that they are being separated. Um, it, you obviously always still have a choice. It's your baby. Um, so you could always say no, um, but they will request that if you are going to continue to have the baby in the room that you agree to be six feet away from the baby unless you are actively breastfeeding. And when you're breastfeeding, you have to be wearing a mask um, and, um, you know, really good hand washing. They kind of have like a little bit more of a strict routine for you in the room, but that you know, so you always have the option to do what you feel like is best for you and your family, but they, they're going to really want you to be wearing a mask and washing hands well and limiting exposure as much as sure. possible. Sure. Um, otherwise, yeah, they're separating mom and baby, which is just heartbreaking, yeah. you know. I know and it breaks that, my heart too. That's, I mean, it, it's so hard, but I think that for a lot of people knowing that they have the final say is different than I think the stories that we've seen portrayed in the media where it, mm -hmm. it does seem like they're not given a choice and yeah. I, not that that's an easy choice to make in any way. Right. That sounds perfect. Well, and I, my, this is only for patients that test positive, by the way, this isn't for like all, this is like if you are COVID positive. Um, and my argument, and this is just, you know, again, this is I'm not a doc. Yeah, I'm, I am a doctor. I'm not your doctor right now. Um, my argument is you're about to go home with them anyway. You know, like I just, I get it. I 100% I get it. They're looking out for the safety of the baby, but it's, it makes me really sad. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, I mean, yeah, I know. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's really hard. It's really, yeah, I guess that's, that's yeah. if you needed further, like further motivation to quarantine prior yeah. to prior to yeah. birthing. But I, I do want to take that as an opportunity to say, and I know you guys are going to have like a birthing center um, and home birth discussion maybe another time. Um, I still think the hospital, this is obviously, I have to say this, I'm a physician, but I still think the hospital is a really safe place to have your baby because you're still always given access to anesthesia and NICU. Um, I like, please do not let COVID be the reason that you would change your mind about a hospital birth. If you don't want one, that's that's your choice. But if okay. you were going to have one and now you're thinking you shouldn't because of COVID, please don't let that be the reason because I still think the hospital is the safest place. I think that that has to be very comforting to a lot of people because I have had that conversation with a lot of people recently. And I know that it's a stressor that you couldn't have planned for if you got mm -hmm. pregnant six months ago. And so, um, yeah. 
I got pregnant <laughs> in September. Right. Yeah. So I think that just, I mean, just hearing that I'm sure mm-hmm. is really comforting to people. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So we're going to move on to questions that you all submitted when you registered. And again, if you need anything clarified, if you have any questions about anything that we've spoken about so far, please feel free to comment in the chat and, and just let us know. Um, one question, this one we kind of already touched on, the ideal time regarding dilation to wait until requesting an epidural. And this person specifically was saying that they're scared to request it too early, but they're also scared that waiting too long they won't be able to have it. And the specific concern was if you request it too early that that could lead to a cesarean birth. Yeah. So yeah, so the, we haven't found that requesting it like too early leads to a C-section. So that's not a, a fear that I think that you should be worried about. Um, I understand the fear, but I don't, I don't think that that's something that will happen. Um, I, I think you should wait until you are starting to feel something, but you're not in so much pain that you're screaming. Um, but the number of centimeters you are is not um, anything that is related to it. That is helpful. Um, another question was best way to communicate that you do not want a synthetic oxytocin pitocin induction and alternatives at age 39, as well as how long is it safe to wait after your water breaks for induction? Yeah, so if you don't want pitocin, just to tell your provider, say, I don't want pitocin. It's really helpful to make a birth plan um, help prior to your delivery and to go over that birth plan with your provider in the office before labor has ever started. So that you know, you guys can discuss like what is your concern with it, and and that way everybody's on the same page. And then when you come into the hospital, bring your birth plan so that your nurse is aware of it as well. And then just in case your provider isn't the one there that day, and the on-call provider is taking care of you, they can go over it as well too. Um, in terms of after your water is broken, so the concern is if labor is prolonged with ruptured membranes, which is the medical term for water being broken, um, that there is a higher risk of infection the longer the labor lasts. So typically we do recommend starting Pitocin once your water is broken so that we can have delivery to help reduce your rate of infection. Um, however, that obviously is a, a shared decision-making thing as well. And as long as you are looking okay and baby's looking okay, we don't have to do that. In our practice, we just um, ask, you know, we'll have patients will call from home to say, um, hey, my water broke, um, do I have to come to the hospital? And no, I mean, as long as you're feeling the baby move and you're not bleeding um, and you don't feel like you want to come to the hospital yet, that's fine. You don't have to. But we do ask that within 24 hours you come in just so that we can check on you and the baby. Um, and that's something that is also dependent upon whatever practice you go to. Um, so that's something to that we'll talk to your provider about. Um, can you just expand a little bit on Pitocin and inductions for our viewers who are not familiar with that? Yeah, so induction is when we start labor for you, whether it be because you want it, you just electively chose to get induced, or because there's a medical indication such as high blood pressure or the baby's not growing well or whatever the case may be. And the way that we induce you totally depends on how dilated you are to start. And um, Ultimately, Pitocin usually becomes a part of the induction process. So let's say you're not very dilated in the beginning. We'll do something what's called a cook balloon. Um, and I always tell everybody don't freak out by the word balloon. Like everybody imagines like a child's balloon. It's not like that. It's just a catheter that gets inserted through your cervix and it helps kind of stretch it mechanically open. And then at the same time, you get a medicine by mouth that helps soften your cervix and start contractions. Um, and then after a while the balloon comes out and then usually that's when we start Pitocin. Or if you're like already four centimeters dilated from the get-go, we may just start Pitocin. Mm -hmm. And that's just a type of medicine that goes through the IV that helps um, mimic contractions that your body would naturally make. It's just sort of forcing your body to go into labor um, because of the, whatever reason we're deciding to do the induction. Um, so that's, that's kind of what it is and, and why we're doing it. That's perfect, thank you. Um, let's see, one other question is, I have pelvic girdle pain, which sometimes causes sharp shooting pains on my pelvis. What exercises or therapy should I be doing to strengthen this area? And what position should I consider for labor? Um, I know that we talked earlier about me answering this question, but do you have any thoughts on this? Um, again, I think the positioning is you know, kind of based on whatever is most comfortable for you. Um, 
I do, I am at, and I'm, I'm not sure if any BirthFit people are on here um, right now, but I'm a huge fan of BirthFit and I'm sure BirthFit probably has quite a few um, exercises that would, they would recommend and whatever you would recommend as well. Yeah, sure. I mean, when it comes to pelvic girdle pain, I think that when you're talking about sharp pain shooting down your, your pelvis, I'm assuming that you mean pubic symphysis pain. So pain at the front of the pelvis and that, that bone right at the bottom. Um, and sometimes that'll cause sharp shooting pains and you'll feel it shooting down into the groin. Um, another type of pelvic girdle pain can also be sacroiliac or SI joint pain. And that's felt towards the back where the sacrum meets the hip bone. So it depends where your pain is, but typically what we see is pelvic pain, pelvic girdle pain, pubic symphysis pain that begins in pregnancy because of all of the changes happening in your body. But there are a few, a few different reasons that I see really commonly causing that pain. Anything from tightness in the muscles in your inner thighs because if those muscles are shortened and spasmed if you imagine this is the bone and your short your hip or your leg muscle attaches to that bone and it's tight it'll tug on it and that can contribute to pain another common cause of that pain is weakness weakness in the abdominal muscles which work really hard to support your pelvis or weakness in your pelvic floor which the same thing their job is in part to support your pelvis so if you have weakness in any of those muscles that can make you more susceptible to developing this pelvic pain, this, this pubic symphysis pain specifically. Um, so the first thing that I would recommend if this pain is a really big problem for you is seeing a pelvic floor PT who can at least briefly evaluate what the cause is because that's going to really largely dictate which exercises are most helpful for you. For some people, this just gets better with labor, but for a lot of people, it doesn't. If you're in pain for a long time during pregnancy, it might not just magically disappear as soon as you deliver. So I think that addressing this while you're having the pain during pregnancy can be really helpful. And a lot of this can be evaluated virtually so that's the that's I mean if there is a silver lining into perinatal care right now it's that there's a lot more options virtually and there there are a lot of tests that we can do just by a video call that could allow us to determine at least what a major contributing factor is to your pain um, so I would start there because the exercises could be something as simple as foam rolling your inner thighs, stretching your quad muscles, or it could be abdominal muscle strengthening, pelvic floor muscle strengthening. Um, I talked to a lot of really fit active people who don't know how to keep their core strong during pregnancy, so they just don't. They just avoid that area altogether, and that can make you susceptible to developing this kind of pain. As far as positions to consider for labor, like Dr. Skarziga said, it really comes down to what feels good for you. However, what I hear frequently from people who have this type of pubic symphysis pain is that positions, and, and typically when you have this pain, asymmetrical leg positions can be really irritating. And so if you are in a butterfly position or if your legs are crossed, that can irritate that pubic bone and cause more pain. So oftentimes for laboring, I'll suggest positions like side lying where your upper leg is supported so that you're in that neutral position with your legs parallel to one another um, or on all fours because same thing on all fours your legs can stay relatively parallel without having to be in that lithotomy position that position with your knees splayed um, but it really comes down to what feels best for you yeah how do you feel about like a belly band would that help at all do you think with pelvic floor um, or pelvic girdle pain yeah, it totally can. If the if the cause of the pain is pelvic floor muscle or abdominal muscle weakness, a belly band is basically just acting as your abdominal muscles, right? It's providing a brace for what your core muscles might be too weak to support. Um, so that's one thing that I'll have people try. And you can kind of try that right off the bat because no harm, no foul if it doesn't work. And belly bands aren't typically extremely expensive. So you can usually find a, a relatively affordable option to, to try that. And if you're wondering if it's going to help, another thing that you can do is just take a big belly or like a tie or a scarf even and tie it really tightly around your hips not around your belly but specifically around your hip bones because that's why that's what an SI belt would do which is what I would probably recommend people start with and you can kind of test it if that works that could mean that it's worth investing in an SI, in an SI belt um, but a belly band is also a good option I love belly bands <laughs> there and for some people they feel great and like if it feels great that's great for other people it feels terrible which is why I'm always like you know try it if it feels good great and if it doesn't yeah yeah, yeah. um 
One other question is what should people know about eating before, during, and after birthing in the hospital? That's a great question. Yeah. So, um, it's funny where I trained in Houston, like you weren't allowed to eat anything at all. Um, and I just think that's terrible. Um, so the, what I always tell everybody is don't eat anything that you are not comfortable with seeing come back up because labor tends to be kind of barfy. Um, and so maybe some light things like popsicles or whatever, um, maybe not your most favorite meal in the entire world, but <laughs> ruin it for you. Um, but, uh, you know, whatever you want, um, once you have an epidural, the anesthesiologist is going to prefer that you stick to kind of more clear things like broth and popsicles and juice, because the concern is if, if for the unlikely event that we would have to go for an emergency C-section and your epidural is not working well, and they have to convert to what's called general anesthesia, which is where they place a tube down your throat and breathe for you, they intubate you there is a risk of what's called aspiration pneumonia if you have a full stomach at the time that they are trying to intubate you. So that's why they would rather you be on just kind of clears. Um, but if no epidural or prior to an epidural, whatever you want. That's really helpful. I think that there are a lot of people who are really scared they won't be allowed to eat as soon as they get to the hospital. And yeah. yeah, when I went in for my induction, I made sure to eat beforehand. And then when I had my son, I started contracting. I knew I was going into labor. I had my husband stop and get us dinner on the way because <laughs> I was like, we still have time. Let's right. <laughs> get it in while you can. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, well, great. I actually think that's all the questions that we had prepared. Um, and we got through them faster than I expected, which is fantastic. But now I want to give all of you an opportunity to ask any follow-up questions that you might have or clarification questions. Um, and this can be about anything, about hospital births or perinatal care, prenatal care, postpartum recovery. Um, so if anyone has any questions, now is the right time to ask them. I'll give people a few, a few seconds to write them out. Um, yeah, it's funny. I feel like not eating is something that I've never thought to ask that question. That was, um, th that was a registrant's question, but I hear that all the time from people are like, I'm going to be so hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I see one question here. Can you talk about open glottis versus closed glottis pushing as a labor nurse? I feel like women can move the baby better with closed glottis pushing. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, um, and I want to be sure that I'm understanding in terms of open versus closed glottis, like when you Valsalva, for example, it's when you take a big deep breath in and then you push by holding um, the breath in versus like pushing and sort of like letting it all, all of the breath out in your, in your face and all that. I, said, yes, that's what she yeah, means. Yes. I, um, I prefer closed as well. I feel like people get more of an effective downward push when they are um, kind of forcing all of the um, force of the of the push downward instead of allowing a lot of this like sound and movement out of their mouth that takes away from what should be going down. So I think people push more effectively with closed lettuce. Yeah, so this is really interesting because when I talk to people about push prep, my goal is always to give them options, right? Like here are different ways that you can push at different stages. And so we'll talk a lot about open glottis pushing and low, low vocalizations to help keep the pelvic floor relaxed and how to breathe while you push. But then the research does show that closed glottis pushing is more effective. So mm -hmm. do you feel like it depends where they are in their laboring or do you feel like that's just true across the board? Uh, no, I mean, I think, I think it's variable. Um, and again, it's whatever's most comfortable for you. If, if you would rather do it open and you are fine and baby's fine and we've got all the time in the world, then yeah, let's do it the way you want. But if it's like baby's stressed out and we just need you to give us like two really good pushes and we'll have this baby, I'll probably talk to you about like, okay, I think it would help a little bit if you would just close your mouth and push down more with your mouth closed. Um, but it's, it's variable. Yeah, and this is, have you seen any, any research or even like anecdotally, have you seen any relationship between push phase and prolapse or closed glottis pushing and prolapse? 
Um, I don't know that the answer to that specifically, it would be interesting to see in general, yes, like pregnancy and, and delivery do increase your risk of prolapse, but I don't know if it's related to the way in which you push or not. That's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I see so many people postpartum and like, you know, three to six weeks who are really reflecting on their birth who have prolapse and who are thinking like, if I just didn't push this way, you know, and mm -hmm. I think, like, how do you study that? There isn't really any good research on that, at least that I've seen, but yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I would ask. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Thoughts on umbilical cord milking? Yeah. So we do delayed cord um, clamping. Um, whether or not you know you milk the cord, the thought is that we're allowing to get more of the blood to the baby, um, and uh, that helps increase like red blood cell count and helps decrease bilirubin levels, which helps reduce the rate of neonatal jaundice. So there's a lot of re really good research to show that it's the, um, that cord blood, delayed cord blood clamping um, is what we should be doing as standard of care, which is what we are doing. Um, and, and, you know, milking, I think, is um, just a preference of the provider. Um, so it's something that we do routinely do. Um, and I think if you want to just be sure that your provider is doing it, just make sure that you ask them. And I'll have patients sometimes, like we routinely will do a 60 second delayed cord um, clamping and I'll have patients that are that will say, well, do we have to do it at 60 seconds? Could we do three minutes? Could we do five minutes? And we'll, we'll do that if you want. So you just have to let us know. Interesting. Um, that's not something that I'm familiar with. So it's really interesting. Um, what is the role of the labor nurse? Summarize their duties is another question. Yeah, so your labor nurse is the best. Um, they are able to be there with you at the bedside because a lot of times your provider is running back and forth from the office or even if it's like on a weekend, they're taking care of patients that are on the postpartum unit or maybe there's like four or five patients laboring and they're running back and forth between rooms. But your labor nurse is typically just with you and maybe one other patient. So they're able to really spend a lot of dedicated time with you. Um, so they can be an advocate for you if there's certain things that you're requesting. They're also going to be the ones helping you get different positions, making sure that your pain is well controlled. Um, I mean, you're, and we really rely on our labor and delivery nurses. So when I have a nurse call me that they're concerned about something, I stop what I'm doing immediately because they're the ones at the bedside. I'm not. So if, and I really trust our nurses. If my nurse tells me that they're concerned about something, I'm like, okay, I'll come right now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When I, when I talk to people about their birth experiences, I feel like labor and delivery nurses are so frequently cited as like just such a, such a support and positive addition and like just such an incredible team member. And so that's, that's great to hear. Yeah. Um, how do you know if you're using your core correctly during labor? This might be a better question for you. I was going to say, I don't know which one, which one of us wants to take this one. Yeah. Um, so I think that when I talk to people about pelvic floor and core strength throughout pregnancy and labor, people will frequently say, like, I need to strengthen my core. I need to strengthen my pelvic floor for labor. Um, and on one hand, yes, strengthening your abdominal muscles and your pelvic floor shows to reduce the likelihood of leakage, shows to reduce the likelihood of prolapse, of diastasis recti, of all sorts of stuff postpartum. However, we don't necessarily need core and pelvic. I mean, we do, we need core and pelvic floor strength, but your core muscles are not the thing that's pushing your baby out. Like Dr. Scarzago was talking about earlier with that open versus closed glottis pushing. Pushing is really more about the ability to increase abdominal pressure in a downward direction. So you're not clenching your abdominal muscles or flexing your abs to do that effectively. You are using the pressure from all the way from your jaw to your throat downwards. Um, so there are ways that what I will typically train people to do is not so much focus on using their core during pushing, but focusing on keeping their pelvic floor relaxed during pushing so that you're not, when you have a uterine contraction, when you're pushing and you're pushing downwards, your pelvic floor isn't squeezing and lifting and fighting that. So that mm -hmm. as you push, your pelvic floor has the ability to open and relax to make your pushes more effective. Um, but using your core during labor is not, is not something that we typically focus on in training, although core strengthening throughout pregnancy and early stage postpartum is a really, really beneficial thing to do for your body. Cool. Um, I want to make sure that we answer everybody's questions, yeah. but I also want to help my husband. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that we probably won't be able to get through all of them. So if you want to scroll or, through. I, and I was going to say too, if we just can maybe stop with the one, the, like the ones that are posted right now. So after Celia's and then we won't take any more after that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we can move through these a little faster too. So, um, 
real quickly, my hospital has a 23% C-section rate. Is that high? No, actually, the, the standard rate in the U.S. is 30 to 35 percent, so a 23 percent C-section rate is actually really good. Um, our practice has about a 20-ish percent rate. Um, keep in mind that the C-section rates, there's a little bit uh, to know and to understand behind the rate. So it totally depends on the patient population at that particular hospital. Um, we know that um, uh, maybe a hospital that has a lot of first-time moms, there's going to be a little bit of a higher rate of C-section. Or a hospital that takes care of patients that happen to have more medical complications, that's also going to increase the rate of C-section as well. Um, so you have to kind of take the patient population into consideration when you're under, trying to understand the rates of, of um, C-section. And then you also have to take into consideration the experience of the providers. So our practice is really skilled at operative vaginal deliveries, which does help reduce the rate of um, C-sections that we have amongst our, our patient population. But again, that's, and that's a totally different conversation, but, um, you know, that's something that, that you can talk to your provider about was kind of what's their comfort level with that and, and what's your comfort level with that too, because we wouldn't do it unless you were okay with it. Um, do you want to set a time that we have a hard stop so that we get through questions, but I also want to be mindful of, of your night. Yeah, this time. maybe in like 10 more minutes. Okay. Minutes okay. I think we can get through a, yeah. a bunch of these in 10 minutes. So um, can you talk about any differences in outcomes for babies between medicated and unmedicated birth? Not that I'm aware of um, in terms of any research that I'm aware of, no. I'm not, I'm not familiar with any research on that either. Um, how common or recommended is it to freeze the umbilical cord for any potential cancer or degenerative disease that the kid might develop? Yes, that's called cord blood banking. And that's, I'd say, you know, I don't know in terms of the standard rate amongst the U.S., but I'd say probably in our practice, about 20% of patients do it. Um, and that, that may be a little bit off, but um, that's what I can think of. Um, and the thought behind it is that you're banking cord blood, not for the current child, but for a future child or a, a separate child or a separate family member. So any cord blood that you bank for, um, you know, to help a, an individual with a particular disease process, you cannot give that person back the same blood, right? Because then you're going to just be giving them the same issue. So that's why it's not good for that particular child that burst at that moment. Um, so what I recommend is if you want to do it, great. It's just within your own financial resources to decide if that's something that you want to do. It is expensive. Um, I think that people that it's really good for are people with known family members with medical issues. That's helpful. Otherwise, it's like an insurance policy in case somebody develops an issue later. Do you have any idea what the cost is for banking? Over a over thousand. Okay. Yeah. Um, if at 36 weeks the baby's head is currently facing down, what are the chances he could become breech in the remaining few weeks before delivery? Low. Um, it, it can happen, but most of the time babies um, at 36 weeks, whatever position they're in, is typically the position they like to stay in. That's helpful. Um, can you talk about intermittent versus continuous fetal monitor monitoring during hospital birth? Is intermittent monitoring an option with an induction? It seems like the continuous fetal monitor would severely restrict positions available for laboring. Yeah. So, um, yes, intermittent monitoring, monitoring is an option. It depends on your medical history as well as what's going on with your baby. But yes, that's something that we do. Um, and I'm all for it because it means that you get to be up and moving a little bit more. Seton specifically, we have wireless fetal monitoring. So that's something that's really cool. Even if you had to have continuous monitoring, we can always know what's going on with your baby because it's a wireless monitor and you can be walking the halls, you can take a shower and we can still be, be watching the baby. Yeah, it's a really cool thing that I like to talk about. Um, Is that yeah, the, I'm sorry? Is that standard? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's we have them for every room. The only time we don't use them is if they're not working for some reason. Like every once in a while, there's a weird like software interface right. thing. But otherwise, yeah, we're using them for everybody. That's fantastic. Um, and so, yeah, so intermittent monitoring is definitely an option. You would just need to talk to your provider about it. I will tell you, if you're VBACing, most of us are going to be more comfortable if you have continuous monitoring, which could be done with a wireless monitor. Sure. Um, what do you wear during a pregnancy? Are you wearing, or I imagine this is during childbirth, are you wearing a gown? Yeah, and I would recommend wearing the hospital gown. You don't have to, but just because it's, all, it's a messy thing, labor's messy, um, and the hospital gown, you know, you don't care about, so use that in case it gets really messy, but you can wear whatever you'd like. 
Um, are there any associations between epidural and autism or any other disorders? Not that I'm aware of. Um, how long time-wise is considered to be delayed cord clamping? Yeah, so what 60 seconds is what we typically do standardly, but if you wanted longer, you could just talk to your provider about that. Um, I am currently 34 weeks and have been on bed rest since about 26 weeks. I've been worried that my inactivity will make labor considerably harder because I haven't been able to stay active. What can you recommend that I can do while on bed rest to still prepare my body for physically and for the marathon of childbirth? Yeah, um, this is a tough question to answer, not being your specific provider. So I would just say talk to your provider to find out what they specifically mean by bed rest. Like, did they just mean like modified activity? Did they mean pelvic rest? Um, or are they just saying bed rest so that you'll, your stress levels will go down, in which case you can still do some activity? Like, it just depends on what they meant by bed rest. So I would just talk to your provider about that. Yeah, and that's, as a pelvic floor physical therapist, that's a conversation that I have with a lot of my patients' providers because you're typically still free to do something or safe to do something. It's just a question of what that is, and your provider is the only one who can answer that. Yeah. Um, any advice from my doula to make things smoother with the OB slash nursing staff? We have a really great relationship with the doulas here in Austin. I love all of them. Um, and having a doula has been shown to reduce your rate of C-section. So we're huge proponents of it. Um, so I've, I've never had an issue. Um, and so it's always been smooth. But I mean, I think that just being having them be open and communicating, you know, it's hard because the doula is typically just there for the delivery versus like you have a relationship with your provider for nine months. I have many of my patients bring their doulas towards the end to the prenatal care visits. That's nice. Yeah, which allows us to like talk about things together um, and you know, sometimes a patient will, you know, you just forget what you, you were like, I, I meant to ask this and I totally forgot. So just having a second set of ears to listen and to think of questions is helpful. It With COVID right now, though, it's tough because we're limiting the office to um, just the patient, but you could always FaceTime in or, or um, put your doula on speaker and we could talk. I know a lot of a lot of local doulas are doing kind of virtual support throughout birth, and and also just quickly on the topic of doulas, I know that for a, for a lot of people, for a lot of doulas that I've spoken with, having a provider who is strongly opposed to doulas could also be considered a red flag because it. I mean, doulas have such positive associations on birth outcomes, and if your team is not open or receptive to that, not because of COVID, but generally speaking, that could be something that you want to take into consideration. Um, how long do you wait to cut the cord with a C-section? 60 seconds as well? We typically do 30 seconds just because the rate of bleeding for mom is higher, but if your bleeding's okay, we could do 60 if that's what you would like. Okay. Um, thoughts on episiotomy? So I can probably count on one hand the number of times I've done it. I've been in practice for seven, eight, that's my eighth year. Um, it's very, very rare. Um, the times that we do it are for two things. One is if um, you are pushing well, but baby's stressed out and we're just trying to get the baby out quickly. Um, and it's like you could do it, but baby's not going to give you the amount of time that you need to get past that little bit of vaginal tissue that's holding everything back. Um, but it, we like it's rare that that happens. The only other time that I would do one is in the, like I mentioned before, the rare occurrence of the emergency called a shoulder dystocia. And that's where we would cut an episiotomy to make space for our hand to be able to go in and get the shoulder that's stuck um, or the opposing shoulder. But again, it's super duper rare. So it's not something that's routinely done. That's pretty incredible because I know that episiotomies used to be a lot more common. Yes, and so I know. Hearing you say that is like really quite fantastic. Yeah. Um, anything you suggest in preparing for a husband who thinks you'll pass out during labor? <laughs> oh, no, no, I don't. I'm sorry. It's like, <laughs> just have them try to sit, you know, during a lot of it and like face you instead of facing down towards what's where the action's happening. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's horrible. <laughs> but you know, when it's, when it's his kid, I think he's probably gonna be able to handle it a little bit better than you think. Probably. Yeah. Um, okay, our last question of the evening. How common are stillbirths? My provider won't stop talking about it and it's stressing me out. I'm having a really healthy pregnancy and I'm 38 weeks. 
Um, not super common. It totally depends on your medical situation. You know, if there's something else going on with you or with baby, then that would increase the risk. There's certain things that we know increase the risk. For example, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, inadequate fetal growth, um, history of a prior stillbirth, things like that. Um, but it, it's not super common. Um, and I'm sorry that that's, that's happening, but it may be coming from a place, you know, there's always two sides to every story. It may be coming from a place where the provider had a bad outcome and is just being a little bit more anxious or concerned. I don't know. Um, and I think that maybe would, a good question to ask your provider is like, what things, what sort of testing could we be doing to help like, be making sure that everything is okay? Like, what could we do to be reassured that, I'm not at risk for this. And just maybe try to get a feel for why they're so concerned. Um, yeah, that's, that's difficult. Yeah. Uh, but that's, that's great advice. Yeah. Uh, Was there anything in this Q&A that we didn't go over? Oh, God. That's all the same. Oh, there's um, some are different, but some are the same. Let's see. There are possibly, I mean, these might be too many considering our time. I know that you wanted to be off by, by around now. Um, I can answer. So best books for pregnancy prep. I really like the book Expecting 411. Um, and there's also a book called Expecting Better that I really like. Um, and then... Uh, so the thoughts on the 40 week study, that's actually a 39 week study. It's called the ARRIVE trial. Um, I'm a big fan of the ARRIVE trial, but it's also one of those things that, um, you know, it's a shared decision making. So this, the study came out in 2017. It was a study that was done over thousands of women at multiple hospitals here in the US. And what they did was they looked at, they split women into two groups, a group of women that got induced at 39 weeks and a group of women that just waited for spontaneous labor. And all of these women were first time low risk healthy moms. Um, and they looked and, you know, they just induced or waited for spontaneous labor. And what they found um, really kind of blew everybody's mind. For the longest time, we used to think that induction increased the rate of C-section, and this actually showed that induction um, amongst the study was, um, had a lower rate of C-section. Nothing bad happened in the group of women that waited for spontaneous labor, but we just saw a lot of improved outcomes in the 39-week induction group. And so for that reason, we are now offering elective inductions to everyone at 39 weeks. I, I offer it as well, but it's a shared decision-making thing. And by no means is it like something that you absolutely have to do. I just want my patients to know that it's an option. The reason that we think the C-section rate is lower is um, the the there is a thought that beyond 40 weeks, the placenta is no longer perfusing as well. And when placental perfusion decreases, that means babies may not tolerate labor as well because they're not getting as much oxygen and blood supply. And so by inducing at 39 weeks before the due date, um, we're capturing those babies before the placental perfusion is, is worse. And so those women that ended up with a C-section in the spontaneous labor group, it wasn't because they couldn't have a vaginal birth from anything about their body. It's because the baby wouldn't really let them ever get there. The baby was too stressed out to allow for a vaginal birth. And so the thought is that inducing at 39 weeks, those women that subsequently went on to have a C-section, maybe they wouldn't have um, by, by getting induced while the placenta was still perfusing well. So that's, that's, that's where the study is coming from. And that's what we're we're talking to patients and offering, but again, that's totally your choice and, and not um, required by any means. And also maybe not always an option depending on what's going on with the hospital, like the acuity of labor and delivery. If there's, if it's a really busy day, they're not going to make, they're not going to put in an elective induction when there's 10 medically indicated inductions that are scheduled for that day. Or if there's a bunch of um, spontaneous laboring women coming in, the elective inductions are going to get bumped. So there's, you know, there's two, there's things to know about that. That's interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't heard of that study, so I'll have to go find it. Yeah. I think that these other questions we've actually already um, already answered, with the exception of the last one that I think just came through. Is there any real risks waiting for spontaneous labor after 41 weeks if the placenta looks fine via ultrasound? Yeah. 
Yeah, so the looking at the placenta via ultrasound is is not a perfect science. Um, what we would do to look and make sure that everything's okay is what's called a biophysical profile, which is where we do an ultrasound to make sure that the baby is doing things that we want the baby to be doing, such as breathing, moving, and making adequate fluid. If those things all look fine, I think it's reasonable to push out to 42 weeks, but that would be, I, I am not personally comfortable beyond 42 weeks. I don't know many providers who are, um, but that's a, a decision that you would have between you and your um, provider. Um, so it's not necessarily that we're looking at the placenta, it's that we're looking to make sure that the baby's doing certain things. And therefore, if, if there's one of those things the baby's not doing, the thought is the placenta is not perfusing as well. So the baby's not making adequate fluid or moving as much because the baby's stressed because they're not getting enough oxygen. That's interesting, it's helpful. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. We will cut off Q&A here. Thank you so much for your time and for yeah. sharing all of your experience with us. I know that everybody in, in the viewers really, really appreciates it. And I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. So thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. And um, thank you to your husband and your family for coming oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. here. I see him. He's, he's wearing her. <laughs> he's like a baby carrier. He's wearing her. <laughs> Um, but thank you. And thank you to all of our attendees. Thank you all yes. for being here. Thank you for your participation. Again, if you're interested in birth preparation, you can follow that link in the chat. I'll send up a, I'll send out a follow-up email to, to all of you as well. Um, we will have this recorded. So if you, if you want a copy of the recording, again, please reach out and just ask, um, ask for it. But thank you so, so much, Dr. Escarzaga. This thank was really you. Fun. This was fun. Um, enjoy the rest of your maternity leave. Thank you. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good night. Bye.